Welcome to Shattered Reality with your hosts Kate Valentine and Farusha. Prepare to have your paradigms shifted and your truths questioned. And now, Shattered Reality. Well, here we are again, Farusha. And I guess you'd like to slate the date? Absolutely. Today is September 12th. 2017, and um, we are back for our 54th show mm. after a mm, few weeks break for the summertime and eclipse viewing. Right, right. And so uh, I went down to view the eclipse. Did you actually see it or did it cloud over? It was just at the, it, it clouded over and a and uh, but I did see a great deal of it. I saw it got okay. dark. I saw the planet Venus, which was uh, there. I heard the insects come out in the uh, semi darkness, and all around the um, the horizon, you could see a little bit of light. But the the sky above was completely dark. Mm. Um, and then the cloud moved because it wasn't very thick, and it moved away. So I saw most of the eclipse, but like. A, a mile and a half away, they had no cloud. Mm. Ah, aggravating. S- yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm. And I also went to see the Serpent Mound out in Ohio, built by the Mound Builder Civilization, uh, it, which was fascinating too. But no time for that right now because nope. we have today a wonderful guest. And our guest is Dr. Roger Nelson who is a Ph.D. He was the coordinator of research at the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Laboratory, the Pear Lab, as many people know it, at Princeton University from 1980 to 2002. And he has directed the Global Consciousness Project, the GCP, since its inception in 1997. His interests lie in the areas of psychology, physics, philosophy, and the arts. And he has been given opportunities to collaborate with creative interdisciplinary teams at Pear and elsewhere, developing ways to study consciousness and intention. So he's right up our alley with that consciousness and intention. Uh, Roger's work integrates science and spirituality, including research that is directly focused on numinous communal experience. Building on years of laboratory experiments, Roger began using random event generator technology in the field to study the effects of special states of group consciousness. This led naturally to the GCP, which is designed to register indications of a coalescing global consciousness responding to major world events such as 9-11, the beginnings of war, or New Year's Eve. Speculative interpretations suggest that we may be looking at some form of consciousness field. Though we don't have a full explanation, this frontier research provides evidence of interconnection and interaction of our minds with the environment. It is consonant with ancient and modern ideas about a nascent greater consciousness. And now, Dr. Roger Nelson, welcome to Shattered Reality Podcast. Uh, Hello, thank you for having me on. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us. It's really quite an interesting resume, and I'm sure you're a very busy person, so we really appreciate your being here today. We do. And to start off with, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about your earlier self. Like, we all know, I mean, people who are in the field, and not our listenership uh, has people who are in the fields of UFO and consciousness and other anomalous edge science stuff. But not everybody knows about the Pear Lab, though we did have Brenda Dunn on a few weeks ago. Um, but what we don't know, even people who know about you and the Pear Lab and uh, the Global Consciousness Project, they don't know where you came from to start with the Pear Lab prior to 
1980. Uh-huh. As, as is the case for all of us, I came from the stars. <laughs> <laughs> Star stuff. But, seri- but I did, I had a, a curious um, child. I mean, I was a curious kid. And there were um, enormously interesting things that I would get wind of, but I couldn't really learn very much about them because I grew up in a small town in Nebraska and things like yoga and uh, Buddhism and uh, parapsychology, for heaven's sakes, or UFOs. None of those things um, had much uh, of a representation there. So I um, gradually found my way into um, these areas by going to the library and looking for one thing and finding another and until eventually I, my um, curiosity was piqued so much that I gathered some of my friends to do experiments hmm. in what, what uh, we called parapsychology. We did um, ESP experiments. That is, we asked people to try to guess which card is coming up next or um what card would be in the middle of a stack and, uh, and so forth. And it turned out that we, we got results in those experiments, which were exactly the right kind of thing. And by that, I mean, <clears throat> there was nothing uh, so earth shaking, but it was always a little bit different from what should happen if there isn't any such thing as ESP. So in other words, we got results like the scientists uh, who re- read about in the book, also got, and that probably settled me into the a path, um, which had lots of twists and turns, um, where I ultimately um, had the opportunity to dig in and do my own uh, very careful scientific research, along with a bunch of really bright people in Princeton. That's that's very very cool. Now um, you say that you got some uh, results that were. A reasonable amount of, I guess we'll say, standard deviation from the the flat line, right? Uh, or as you guys put it, the random walk. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah, right. I mean, uh, basically, uh, when most of the experiments that we had at the uh, Pear Lab at Princeton used some kind of had some kind of random source we also did what was called remote perception or remote viewing experiments but uh, all of the all the machine oriented or mind machine interaction experiments had some kind of random source and what a random source does is unpredictable normally and that's the criterion for it to be random is that from one step to the next step there is no way um that the, the uh, nature or the um, the heads or tails quality of the next step can be um, guessed or predicted. So what we did was set up experiments with really high quality random sources, a lot of different kinds, things like uh, pendulums and uh, water fountains and uh, beautiful optical displays and and so forth, along with classical random number generators. And in all cases, we asked people to try to change that system so that it was, it did become predictable in the sense that they would get um, higher numbers if that's what they were trying to do. If they were um, trying for low numbers, then we would expect, and we did find, that those truly high quality random sources became a little bit less random, apparently because of intention and consciousness. Who are the people that uh, you used as test subjects? Where, where we, did you get those at random as well, or was there a, a, some sort of a pattern to your choosing them? Um, actually, uh, what we, the way we describe our um, what we called operator um, pool mm-hmm. subjects were uh, people who volunteered. Okay, so they were self-selected. They had to be interested enough to. Discover that we were, we were there, but we didn't look for people who claimed any special power. Mm-hmm. And in a sense, even though it might not be entirely true because of the self-selection, what we um, were trying and 
what we described as our pool was people who are ordinary people with mm -hmm. um, a, a thought to finding out how common is the ability to change the way a random machine works. How common is that, that uh, ability in the population? Hmm. So we wanted regular people, in other words. Right. Well, you did, you did have down there one of our previous... A uh, previous guest, previous to yourself and and, and Brenda Dunn, and that was uh, Angela Thompson Smith, who uh, actually found out that she was quite psychic. I suspect is that the case? Uh -huh. Well, um, we don't, we never did uh, talk very much about the performance of individuals, but Angela did do uh, those experiments. I don't think she would mind, and maybe she even did this herself. If I tell a little uh, story of. Uh, an experience that she reported back after um, doing some of these experiments. She said she was looking at this random number generator and trying to get high numbers or low numbers and or trying to let it just do baselines, which was, um, in other words, let it be. <laughs> so um, she wasn't having any, any success. She tried and she tried uh, different ways and she thought and she, um, you know, concentrated and so forth. And she finally, she said at some point, well, I'm just I'm going to just lean back and read it, a magazine, doggone it. And at that point, she began to get the kind of results <laughs> she was expecting and desiring. So, in other words, she learned how to get out of the way. And I think that is something that is extremely important in these kinds of experiments. We used to say grunting and straining isn't what works. What oh. works is uh, to allow this interconnection, the connection between myself and the machine to happen. Okay. So uh, just at this point, uh, we had, as I had mentioned, um, somebody who wrote me a very interested letter, somebody who may have met you. I think he did meet you back in the past, not in a significant meeting, I don't think, but he was very interested in the subject matter and uh, uh, generally goes out. He's a spiritual seeker, I would say. His name is Bob Paddock, and um, he was under the impression, for one thing, that you were all using uh, radioactive decay, and I uh, explained to him that you were using elect electron tunneling. Do you, do you want to briefly, and I don't want to get way off the, the track in very uh, technical stuff, but uh, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about electron tunneling versus, versus uh, decay of radioactive matter to uh, generate uh, random numbers or events. Right. That's two different technologies for creating true random number sequences. Uh, radioactive decay um, just has a counter, a Geiger counter, um, count in noting the, uh, the ticks, and it uses that um, breakdown of atomic particles, um, to, which is a truly random process. Uh, and you're right. We never did use random sources. Instead, we used diodes and... Um, some other technology, but the diodes are basically a switch which um, is di designed to allow electrons to flow one direction, um, but not the other direction. And our, our circuits were set up to push electrons against the barrier of the switch uh, where they, and they should not have, you know, they shouldn't be able to um, get through the barrier but because of this quantum level process called electron tunneling, some electrons um, appear on the other side of the barrier and they create a tiny voltage which fluctuates randomly. That is what we sample and turn into ones and zeros for our random sequence. So it's a very, um, that's a, just as radioactivity is a completely unpredictable quantum process which produces truly random numbers um, that qualify as unpredictable. But, Is that good enough? I, Very good. But I think the point of all this uh, research on yours was to lead you uh, more deeply into global... Uh, Consciousness. Yeah. And, and I think that... Is that your 
your main interest now at this time? I was thinking. Well, the Global Consciousness Project uh, came came after the two earlier stages, one of them that we've been talking about, machines and laboratory and people uh, intentionally trying to change their behavior. The second stage was what we called field research or field REG research, random number generator research, where we would take a very, you know, a very miniaturized version of this um, electronic random number generator into the field with a computer that could collect the data, put it in files where we could then later do an analysis. And the protocol there was to go to some place like um, a fab- fabulously engaging musical conference, a, con- a concert, or uh, perhaps a, a meeting of people who are going to be doing something really creative or a ritual or a ceremony of some kind. The idea was that if people come together and become a kind of group forgetting about their individual um, qualities and interests and instead becoming literally a, a, a component in a group consciousness, then we would expect to see changes in the random uh, sequence, more or less as if there were an intention. In this case, it would be just attention um, or even a consciousness field that was generated by the group, um, which would include the random number generator, almost as if it were a member of the group, and it too could partake in this kind of group, uh, coherent group consciousness. And that led to the third stage, which was this uh, world-spanning network of um, random number generators placed all over the world, hosted by people who are interested enough to just run a computer continuously, and um, with software designed to send us um, on a regular basis, the data which formed a continuous stream of data from um, which should be random and was basically most of the time random from um, 60 or 70 places around the world. So that's the technology. And then the question that we asked in the global consciousness part of this was a little bit like what we asked for the group consciousness. If there is an event in the world or if people decide um, from within their own um, uh, motivations to come together in a kind of coherent way, if there's a terrible tragedy that engages millions of people around the world in compassion and uh, sympathy or uh, maybe other emotions, we would predict that they... Um, just as happened in our field experiments with smaller groups, that uh, this engagement of large numbers of people in a coherent, synchronized kind of emotional state that would gather in and somehow include our network of random number generators, which we would predict then would show changes from random. And indeed, that's what we found um, repeatedly over almost 20 years now. Well, let me ask you um, one question um, relating to uh, 9-11, um, since that has just happened, uh, our anniversary of 9-11, right. so to speak. Yeah. Um, to me, the day before 9-11, I, I had some indication that something was going on. And one thing that happens to me personally is before, often before there's a big tragedy, everything seems to be very quiet. It's like the, there's a certain level of noise inside my head that seems to flatten out and go dull. Now, I'm uh-huh. not claiming anything on this. You know, I'm not trying to put myself out there as claiming something. But I understand that sometimes the, the, uh, the random number generators have a precognitive aspect to it um what at what level do you notice this before a tragedy and would you put out a notification if it was if things suddenly went wazzle let's say you know really way off the standard deviation would you uh would you make a statement um it's a good question and a fair one that many people have asked um especially inspired by the the apparent uh, change in the data in on 9/11, some f- four or five hours before the first plane hit. Um, we don't have a kind of a protocol for uh, looking at 
um, or looking for major changes before events. Um, and so we actually don't do that. If we did uh, look for spikes, as people usually refer to that, and we found one, um, I wouldn't know what to announce. So if you can, if you think about this amazingly complex uh, world we live in, there's you know this eight million, uh, eight billion people, and how many uh, possible events uh, involving their consciousness um, every minute of every day. So we really just wouldn't know what a spike uh, might portend. And so we don't try to make any predictions like that. Our work is always, um, you know, the analytical work and uh, attempts to understand what's going on is always um, retrospective in the sense that we make a prediction before we know anything about the data. We make a prediction that because of this event that causes a kind of synchronous, coherent consciousness, we think the data will change, and then we, after having stable, made a stable, um, identifiable predictions, specifying the beginning time and the ending time and what we're going to do for analysis, only then do we look at the data. And only that way can we actually get interpretable statistics. It's a, it's a thought that, it, that occurs to lots of people, and um, I wish we could. <laughs> Uh, identify what, you know, identify a spike and 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 warn people, or possibly we'd we'd um, just uh, not make an announcement that there's going to be a great celebration pretty soon, and that will change the data, or has already changed the data. So I'm sorry, uh, we we can't do that. It it just isn't um, in the nature of the technology, even though it may have some kind of response to an event before the event happens. Well, and then, too, I mean, even, let's say, if you could, that would be quite a responsibility. You would have to, uh, you know, possibly put people in a panic and cause a lot of problems that way, too, I think. So, right, and I certainly, yeah. certainly wouldn't want to do that, especially no, no. If, I, if I didn't even know what it was they were supposed yeah. to be panicked about <laughs> yeah. or where. No, I, I, I certainly... <laughs> agree with that, that it would be irresponsible to put out a panic call. Um, yeah. I just Right after 9-11, when uh, got, the word got out that we did, did have um, a really clear change in the data before the event, quite a number of entrepreneurs immediately started inventing uh, <laughs> uh, terrorism detectors. Oh dear! I, I did the best I could to disabuse people of the notion that that was going to work. You know, I, I would say that you do what used to be called pure science, and one of the uh, downfalls, if anything, of that is that you hardly ever made any money at it. And um, but it's interesting that uh, as soon as people think that they can use it, suddenly there's a lot of interest in developing that field. Um, but I, well, you know, there there are very definite uses for it, yeah. and, uh, and not not that they would necessarily lead to making a lot of money, but mm. uh, the fact that we are interconnected, which I think is demonstrated without question in this this uh, not just my work but other related and similar kinds of work, we are connected in ways that we don't understand. In fact, we don't even perceive them for the most part. Some sensitive people realize that we're all, you know, there's a kind of deep lying subconscious or unconscious um, um, strand of connection that binds us all together. We don't, um, if we, I, I'm personally convinced, and this is what I do when I'm uh, giving talks in various places around the world, I try to persuade people to um, look at the data. Uh, let the data speak to them about this possibility that there is something about ourselves that we don't really know very uh, much about. Think deeply about the implications of it, which are along the lines of the same things the wise ones in every culture have always said. We are one. We are. It's an illusion. We're separated, and that we, um, you know, that this the idea that we should, um, you know, live as if we were isolated beings. <laughs> You know, all of that um, 
leads to a kind of application. We need to grow up and we need to do it rather quickly on this planet because we're destructive because of our immense creativity and capability and our, up to this point, fairly lacking social uh, comprehension. So we, uh, we're, our powers are being misapplied and they could, it could be a, an easy switch to make. You know, people can become extremely rich and powerful by doing good things and constructive things. Don't have we don't have to uh, knock it all down. So rant over, <laughs> but I think in other words there is very important practical uh, value in. Yeah, but but a lot of people that haven't even studied it scientifically just sort of come by it by second nature. I mean, you have all the propaganda specialists of World War II. You have Madison Avenue. Uh, sports people certainly recognize home team advantage. So, you know, it, the uh, what, you, what you're proving has already been recognized non-scientifically by people. And as you point out, usually not for good things. Uh, yeah, the people that try to do it for good, like the various religions of the world, tend to get, I, I, I think, usurped by people who then turn the religion into political motivation. So it, it is a sh- I don't understand what this this whole path to destruction is about. Um, I don't know. Well, I it's I, mostly greed. I would just <laughs> like to ask about uh, a little bit about um, the comparison to animals because uh, we're all animal lovers on this side and I think that uh, that you and your lovely wife also enjoy animal companionship um, and a lot of herd animals uh, and birds and so forth seem to have some kind of um, uh, inst- we call it instinct but it is an ESP of sorts going on between them right yeah. That um, that uh, seems to guide the flocks of birds or certainly insects and some herd animals to behave as they do. So um, is the application of um, the GCP, Global Consciousness Project, does that seek to in any way, see, you know, um, bolster that idea of our ESP in the sense of instinct? Um, I, I think, you know, I got a little bit distracted because I saw this, um, I think it was just a, like an aphoristic kind of quote it says, dogs don't have egos. Well, that's not true. <laughs> you think that's not true? <laughs> that's definitely not true. <laughs> I, and, um, uh, well, maybe if, it's, uh, if, not if you true. think maybe of dogs have egos, but I thought the, uh, uh, I took the meaning of it being something like, they therefore can uh, kind of like accept what's going on. Yeah, well, maybe birds don't have egos. I they don't know, do but too. no, no, <laughs> dogs definitely have a sense of self because if you have ten dogs and you call out, "Yo, brownie, come here," that brownie goes there. The other night, I look at you and go, oh, "We're not brownie. We're not coming over there." So they have a right, sense of that's, self. That's a sense of self is not the same thing as an ego. Oh, you thinking... ego that I think is referred to there oh, okay. is one where. It's all me. Oh, okay. I have to have mine first. And mm. uh, you haven't you. owned a good. <laughs> you haven't owned a shih tzu. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think they do to some extent, but I, I, don't you? Well, I mean, I, I cats. Think God they, knows, cats do. They have an idea <laughs> of like which, uh, like the order of uh, who's in charge. Dogs yeah. do. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that some. I think listening to Eckhart Tolle on the subject of dogs is rather interesting because he does speak about how some dogs get um, kind of very domesticated and they get to... Uh, I have a friend who's got a uh, a miniature Doberman pincer and this dog, Baby B, uh, she likes to get dressed up. Yeah. She likes her clothes. Yeah. I mean, it's just really bizarre, but it's yeah. something in a sense. I mean, and he, she's adorable, and my friend is great. Um, however, yeah, but it's something that yeah. humans like do to dogs, I would say. I don't think in the wild the baby bee would be wearing, um, you well, know, like her maybe. Halloween costume, for instance. But you do maybe have not. alpha dogs. <laughs> yes, that's you what I said. You have alpha dogs, There's, but in the wild, do you have alpha in, dogs? In a way, you know, I could... Yeah. I, 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 
we're probably um, off on, it's yeah. not a bad thing to be off on a strange tangent, but <laughs> uh-huh. I brought it up. I would suggest that, the, that um, our ego is given over into to the dog. <laughs> yeah, if we possibly. Are, I mean, uh, there is that right. side of Why it, yes. Why the dog wouldn't be wearing a tutu? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Baby B wouldn't be wearing her Halloween <laughs> costume, if, if not for that. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, there's a shout-out to you, Louise, just uh, in case you're listening in on that. We did mention your favorite Baby B. Yeah, but, but, um, back to the primates. Back to, back to, the, back to our, our stuff here. I wanted to talk a little bit about something that I've noticed, um, and it may have a relationship um, to uh, the effect that you see with uh, the random event generators. Now, um, I studied quite a bit of remote viewing, for better or worse. I found it helped my um, my uh, psi uh, aspects to grow. And mm-hmm. even though, because it requires a couple of people to do it, I don't do it on an everyday basis. I enjoy going to those type of classes. Now, right. one thing over the course of time, and I've met a, a whole bunch of different former government remote viewers, and um, it, it's something that they disagree on entirely, because I kind of take them by surprise sometimes. And I said, hey, how about uh, remote influencing and you know Stephen Browdy and uh, mm-hmm. how he has studied remote influencing how do you think that that whole idea uh, relates to what you're doing first of all and secondly uh, my uh, I found it interesting that uh, different remote viewers who know each other lots of them um, they, I get very different answers oh no we would never do remote influencing no no the government would never do that no to, um, well, uh, I don't know. I didn't do it. I don't know what the, the government might do. I have no idea what they ha- might have in mind to, oh, yeah, we did that. Right. <laughs> well, I, I think they call it propaganda. Well, I can't know? speak for the government. No, I uh, know. But I can speak to the science and uh, yes, what, please. what we're talking about with this um, um, r- random event number, ra- random number generator, random event generator research, and any other kind of so-called PK is uh, some kind of remote influence. I mean, mm-hmm. it, what that literally means is I'm not touching it. I'm not pushing it with a stick. It's changing because I think about it and, and because mm-hmm. of some kind of mental field. At least that's the interpretation that I personally like. And um, there are other ones. Uh, other, other, you know, different theories of how these kind of thing, kinds of things work, but the but the, the um, global consciousness network has um, devices that are spread around the world, as I mentioned before, and they're separated by thousands and thousands of kilometers or miles, and um, they become correlated during a an event where which is defined by it being powerfully engaging for um, large numbers, millions of people. And so what's going on there is that this engagement, this consciousness state on the part of a large number of people is present in the world. And now remote, at remote locations, remote from each other, remote from whatever might be causing the event in the first place, all that this, by thousands of kilometers, something happens. Some connection is made. So we're talking about remote influencing. There is actually a very a literature of attempting remote influencing on other uh, organic beings or other humans. Is that literature is pretty small, but it exists and it's uh, very persuasive to the uh, possibility. In other words, maybe the the people in the government review, remote viewing programs don't do it. But that doesn't mean they could not do it, at least according to the research. Um, well, that's that's that is a, a good answer for that. And uh, of course, you can't speak for the government. But I thought that the various answers that I got from the various different people was rather amusing. Um, and um, I was wondering to go further with the animal stuff. Um, if you had said I had asked you privately if you ever tested um, any 
effects that the animals might have if you brought it to a, a situation like a dog run or an abattoir on the other end of the spectrum? Uh, at what uh, you know how dogs they get all excited and happy when they go to a, a multiple dog run and they meet their friends and all that kind of thing versus um, some place where animals were being killed. And I I, I don't like to get into the um, the kind of morbid idea, but I I just wondered if if the animals themselves what you think about that idea would they have an effect on the random number generator i don't know any reason why not i think they're uh, interconnected in the same way we are they may not um you know be component parts in a um aware thoughtful self-reflective kind of consciousness um which i imagine that we could in principle uh, become be as human beings but Frankly, I think there isn't a whole lot of separation from humans to animals um, in any part of the spectrum, or even to plants. And when you, if you press me, I'll even say, why not rocks? Crystals. I think consciousness is all per- pervasive, and that we are, you know, kind of missing the boat if we uh, if we um, don't acknowledge that. I think we probably ultimately will understand. And I, I don't mean any time in the next few decades. It's more like centuries or um, if we ever become civilized, it could happen fast. But um, we will eventually understand that the universe is conscious, that it's, um, there is consciousness all, everywhere. And probably it is the source of everything in the universe um, of course, it's not the same kind of consciousness as you and I are, you know, self-perceiving. Where it's a, it's on, it's a different order. It's a little bit like the source of everything. Well, I'm waxing a little too poetic here. I'm no, not, I agree. I I agree. Largely agree. I would take that one step forward, Roger, and ask you about the the idea that. I think about almost every day, uh, I'm that crazy, that I think every day about the small amount of the electromagnetic spectrum which we as humans with our eyes and ears, etc., actually see or hear, that the percentage that we are able to to grasp with our senses is like 1%, less than 1%. I mean, I don't know the current numbers on that. Um So my question to you would be, have you found places, it's a a dual question, have you found places on the surface of the earth where random number generators are placed for your global consciousness project? Have you found places where um, there's an anomalous uh, reading that is specific to the place? Uh, no, I, I haven't, although there's something very closely re- related to that, uh, and it is what I think of as sacred places. That's probably about what you have in mind as well. Those places um, are perceived by us, I think. Um, it isn't clear to me. In fact, I tried to figure this out when I went to Egypt with uh, a bunch of seekers and a random number generator amazing experiences there. One of the questions I had in mind was um, about sacred places. Are they there and we discover them or do we create them by bringing our consciousness and our spiritual being into those places? So it's not a question that you can actually answer. Um, Ultimately, I, I think it's instead a description of where we are. So, um, but to, to um, answer your question, um, in a way, what I found, I have found in my research is, is that the consciousness is what it's really about. And the consciousness is, becomes a little different for either of the, you know, no matter from which direction you approach it, uh, consciousness is different in a sacred space or a sacred place. And that um, difference is the kind of thing which shows up in the data from our random number generators. I can, you know, I um, I think that's um, it's something that no nobody has written much about, but which I'm personally convinced is quite 
you know, not only true, but uh, rather important. So, well, but to further address the real question you're asking, the sacred place affects us, and we in turn, because of the consciousness connection, affect the random number generators. So it isn't the sacred space itself that does anything to the random numbers. It's it's us. Um, I'm reminded of what's called um, local sidereal time effect right. on the performance in rem remote viewing experiments. And it's not 100% clear that um, this has been sufficiently replicated, but it's probably, it's really good data to begin with. People become um, more um, effective in whatever the psi task is at a certain time in the local sidereal day, namely something like 1300 hours, uh, whereas they become weakest at their task in the uh, local sidereal night. Um, and again, if, and a similar kind of thing, the cosmic um, fluctuations, things like uh, electromagnetic, geomagnetic fluctuation also affects people such that they do better at their psi tasks um, you know, when the geomagnetic weather is calm. Yes. So, so the, the geomagnetic weather doesn't affect the random number generator. It affects the person, and that, um, in turn, shows up in a different performance with the, um, in the experiment. Yes, I believe um, Stephen Schwartz did a lot of work with the sidereal time. Am I right about that? It's actually James Spottiswood who's done most of that. Uh, James Spottiswood? Work. Yeah. But, okay. you know, just to interject here, I know a lot of people that uh, listen to this podcast or are interested in this subject would love to become part of your experiment. Is there some way that they can set up a random generator and uh, uh, sort of connect with you var through various software? Well, it's um, I'm actually not adding to the network anymore. Ah, fact, okay. it's, it's kind of winding down, but <clears throat> there are a couple of things. One, the, the database is always publicly available, so if anybody wants to, you know, learn more about it or stir that pot, it's uh, uh, with using, you know, clean protocols and statistical analysis and what, that's, that's one way to participate, and I'm always happy when excuse me, when somebody does that and sends me their results, they mm -hmm. will have asked a question I didn't ask. And it's, it's nice. Um, and then there's another thing. There's a an app which is not yet available, but will be, I'm uh, hopeful, always hopeful, within a few months. It's called the Consciousness app, and it will mm -hmm. have the um, capability of people doing their own personal experiments with a random number generator that's actually hardware and probably pretty good. Uh, can you, do you mind if I just take, quickly tell people that's, ah, good, done. <laughs> um, so this consciousness app will be out. Uh, hmm. so I, how, do, how does somebody get information about that? Uh, oh, just put consciousness app in okay. uh, Google. Okay. And, I hope you Or you will... can look up Adam Curry, A D A M C U R R Y. He's the uh, the spearhead mm -hmm. uh, in the project. And I hope uh, maybe you would let us know so we could announce it on Shattered Reality because you know the people who do listen to this, I I would suspect that more yeah. than fifty percent would be interested in that um, in that app. Is there any? Um, are there any, let's say, uh, websites that you would like to mention uh, while you're on that uh, you would like to, like, say, put out there for people? Right. Well, uh, if they're interested in the Global Consciousness Project, the, the simplest version of the website address is global-mind.org. Okay. And uh, I think the, uh, the consciousness app might be consciousnessapp.com. Um, the ICRL website, which, Bren, which uh, Brenda Dunn, um, uh, you know, is responsible for, 
um, is another one that people might want to look up. IONS, I-O-N-S, that's the Institute of Neurotic Sciences, is um, an important place with a lot of a huge amount of consciousness um, connection. Uh, Dean Radin is there and other uh, scientists or our listeners might know. Oh, yes. Um, the Global Conscious, the Global Coherence Initiative, which is uh, <clears throat> in um, Boulder Creek, Colorado, is part of uh, Heart Math Institute. Yes. That's a very important um, place. There are uh, there are um, lots of European and um, a couple of, um, or, you know, Eastern, like J- Japanese and Chinese kinds of places. Google is your friend. Yes. Uh, start looking for consciousness uh, or you look for something like global consciousness. The first page or so is all just my project, but mm, it quickly gets into other, you know, connected kinds of, of work. You're such a great guy to mention all the other places, too. You know, it shows like a true scientific interest rather than the kind of um, uh, competitive uh, situation. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what your son has done. He has called the uh, the network the EGG, uh, much uh, the egg, much like a, an electro... Uh, Oh gosh! Oh right, yeah, that's really cool. I think. Yeah, I thought it was uh, nice. And um, EEG, everybody has heard of that. It's right. an electroencephalogram. It's basically a monitor for the brain, attempting to capture something of the brain activity and maybe interpret it as mind or something. And the um, what my son said he helped put together put the uh, original software architecture together. Uh huh. Uh, which is, uh, all be, I'm eternally grateful to him and others who've been so um, instrumental in making this thing go. He said, you know, what you're doing looks a little bit like an EEG for the world, and um, you could think of that as an electrogiogram. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> and uh, that would, um, you know, the acronym for that would be EGG, and so we call these um, random number generators scattered around the world, we call them eggs. <laughs> That's good. And the yeah. software that collects the data for, from all these outlying stations is called uh, the basket. Cool. <laughs> Very good. So yeah, there are quite a few other, um, you know, bits and pieces of the project um, language that come from that metaphor. And an egg, of course, is a, in its own right such an interesting concept, a kind of metaphor for life and the beginning uh, and the burgeoning and so forth. So early on, it was easy for me to think of the egg project, which we called it at the beginning, um, helping to birth a new thing, which would be a global consciousness. So not that I... um, think uh, it needs any help it just needs us to get with it <laughs> these synchronicities are quite amazing in terms of a uh, brenda dunn's story about the pear lab and how it got to be the pear lab and how she kept seeing pears everywhere and she was right. forced to sort of agree that that was a good name then so this is this is sort of similar that uh, there are the synchronicities around it now um i i was looking at the site, and one thing I didn't understand how the mechanism worked was how uh, you all generated music. There was some music that is on the site that was sort of generated by the results of certain uh, times that you went out to um, uh, celebrations or uh, when there was a uh, an event that, that was uh, recorded on the uh, random event generators, uh, uh-huh. and music was uh, created. Well, what, what was that about exactly? Actually, uh, you are t- touching upon something that I always um, that I from the beginning hoped um, I would myself be able to do, or somebody else would find the time and interest to do, which is to make music directly using the uh, incoming numbers from these random number generators um, to specify uh, pitches, uh, note durations, pause length, timbre, 
uh, and quality instrumentation and so forth. <clears throat> so, but that never happened. Um, on the other hand, well, actually, there there is some music made uh, like that by a, by the other primary programmer kind of contributor, John Walker, who's a fantastic programmer. He created some music that he says sounds a little like John Cage, uh, which it does. It um, it's actually um, and there are some movies. Um, they're deep in the website and hard to find, but um, if you're really interested, I can send you a link to them. Okay. Um, so it plays this uh, John Cage-like movie, um, which changes according to how five-minute blocks of the of the data are looking. <laughs> so, Interesting. And well, uh, uh, another a friend, a couple of other people made music. Uh, some um, sort of directly, but uh, others just using the uh, random numbers uh, data to select from a mm, kind of a thematic cluster of notes and rhythms and so on. And so that's probably the ones you, if you listen to some, there's a, like there's a one called Solstice on a page called music.html. There's links to various kinds of things. Oh, in fact, I'm pretty sure there's a link to one of those uh, John Walker, John Cage movies there. Okay. But I'm going on at great length. We never, no, nobody ever actually did what I'm hoping might be done. The, the vision, which is kind of an auditory hallucination uh, still, is a kind of uh, slightly unharmonic or atonal drone that goes on and and but it changes and occasionally becomes beautifully harmonic as if the um universe um the chorus of the entire universe suddenly starts singing beautifully that is that is reminiscent um of what the some of the astronauts had said when um, the um, original, um, when when the spaceship, uh, for lack of a better word for the moment, goes behind yeah. the moon and they lose uh, contact with the earth, they have said uh, that they hear this lovely music, um, mm -hmm. the, a sort of uh, a music of the spheres, if you will. Now, I have... I, I don't know the veracity of that. Um, you know, I've only only ever met two astronauts, and I didn't get to ask them that question. One was Ed Mitchell. Um, yeah. But um, I, I wondered, well, that sort of sounds like the harmonies that they might have heard when they yeah. go behind the moon, which I always found so fascinating and such a beautiful concept. I find concept. that fascinating, too. But they, uh, what has been done in, in that <clears throat> context is to... Um, <clears throat> take uh, astrophysical data, change it to uh, sound wave frequencies and play that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sorry about that. Um, but you remind me that the name that I gave this uh, music that never happened was the music of the noosphere. Oh, right. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, one, of the, one of these days. Um. Before we before we say goodbye, I guess that there are two things that I I wanted to mention, and maybe Kate has something else. Yeah, I'm pretty good right now. Um, well, we did have this one question from the gentleman who I had to uh, to uh, make clear that you were not using um, radiation radiation the radioactive decay and that you were using this other electronic tunneling but right. he had put out the this question and i think you've answered it to a bit but maybe you want to speak directly to him on this he says <clears throat> so what do we do with this information at this point i have no idea there's been t over 28 years of study and pair accumulated billions of bits of data from the regs and many types of many types, and what do we do? Uh, and and um, he says here, and I'm quoting him, however, maybe the next time the customer complains that something was not working, perhaps we should ask them what they were thinking of at the time of the anomaly. 
like uh, only it, you say it this way, what were you thinking? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, I, I, I hear the question, and um, I did it as best I can, and I think I may never be able to do it very much better, give a, the answer that uh, seems to me to be important. This is a tool for learning more about ourselves, about our capacities, about what consciousness really is. And it's a, a kind of um, an urgent, urging uh, from, from the universe, um, perhaps sort of indirectly, but from science and from, uh, from our you know, personal interest in the, the way the world is to just uh, lean back, learn as much as we can, and then um, connect with each other. Um, and that's my <clears throat> interpretation. The 28 years of study shows that we are able to do to touch the world with our thoughts. Um, that probably means that we always are touching the world with our thoughts, but we don't know about it. We're not thoughtful about it, and therefore it's, what, the result is a little chaotic. If we, um, as Buckminster once said, Buckminster Fuller, sorry, once said um, in a slightly different context, if we would organize ourselves, we could feed uh, all the people on Earth very well, and in fact, even more people than now exist on Earth. Um, as it is, people are starving, but it's because we're not organizing ourselves we're not, in other words, acting like the potential um, human of, um, that we have. We have so much potential as human beings, and these kinds of subtle experiments and the ex um, kind of ex the outer reaches of what consciousness, what we understand about consciousness, um, those um, the, the results from those experiments from the 28 years and from the Global Consciousness Project. They're all pointing the same direction. We are um, more than we understand we are. And um, it's, it's time. It behooves us to recognize that and get on with the business of becoming human beings uh, as we have the potential to do. I, I don't really think you need to make any excuses for studying this for 28 years. I think you did just fine. Uh, we, we are in agreement yeah. with that, and, and yeah. I, we are in your debt for coming on our humble program, Shattered Reality Podcast, and we thank you very, very much for giving us uh, your time, and um, we hope to hear from you again, and uh, all I can say is... Uh, well, we'll th Bye we'll, for now. Or, or we'll think about it, <laughs> and he'll pick it up. <laughs> we'll think about we it. We will think deeply about it, and then we'll go for it. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank, Thank you, you so much, pleasure. Dr. Roger Nelson, Global yes. Consciousness Project. Yes. Okay. Have a great day, everyone. Okay. You too. Thank you. Bye. So, Kate. Um, yes. I, I also want to thank uh, Bob Paddock for submitting some questions. That I hope nice. I, I did a good job with them, Bob. Uh, if I didn't, I'm sorry. And we'd like to hear a lot more from you. Yeah, we'd like to hear more from all our listeners. Now, I do have um, one other thing to talk about. We have a listener who I'm just going to call Mr. A okay. because he is on the other side of... Um, uh, of, well, not on the other side of the globe. He's in England, and he's mm -hmm. a listener, and um, uh, he's an experiencer. As far as I know, I've, I've read about some experiences he's had uh, in the UFO area, but I'm not going to identify him because we've had a hard time getting our uh, our emails to reach each other at, in, a, in a, a, a good time. You think email happens immediately, but in this case, it did not. Only if you think about it. Only if you think about it, yeah. Mm. But um, now this uh, Mr. A has a story about a real-life anomaly which occurred, um, I think, sometime last week or maybe a little prior to that, a week to 10 days ago. But he's going to get back to me with the exact date, which I will mention on our website. And um, he says that he was walking uh, by the, 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 the cliffs, 
uh, in England uh, on the uh, English Channel. Uh, they were White Cliffs. I don't know if they were the White Cliffs of Dover or not, but he said he was walking on Cooden Beach um, with his uh, wife and dog and taking some family pictures. And he happened to capture this anomalous cloud. Um, Cooden Beach is a place that people go, I assume, to bathe and to sunbathe and to be on the channel, on the waterfront. And he has photos that he took of the Seven Sisters Sea Cliffs uh, from a few miles away. But he hadn't heard the news of the anomaly until a few days later. What he saw in his pictures was a cloud that came up from behind the cliffs and went down over the cliffs. Now what happened, um, it, it, it burned people's skin and their, their eyes. And he says, my photographs may indicate that a cloud of gas could have arrived either directly downwards from the sky above or perhaps may have written, risen upward from the cliff tops as a chimney-shaped cloud resembling a rising rocket-type plume of exhaust or gaseous cloud. That's the only reason why I'm skeptical about, as the national media reported, that the gas cloud suddenly rolled in from the sea before instantaneously harming the cliff walkers and beach sunbathers. In, In my humble opinion, it's most certainly a weird and perhaps even suspicious event, and as far as I know, still unexplained. There is a chance, and I'm taking a suspicious but educated guess here, that this cloud of noxious gas might have come from, say, an oil tanker or likewise, which may have been illegally flushing or clearing its tanks with chemicals somewhat offshore and out of sight or over the horizon, but there had been no such ship seen or reported at that time. The chances of the poison cloud blowing in from France, about 60 miles distant at this point of the English Channel, are minimal. As our National Meteorological Office in Exeter reports that there were only very light winds blowing at the time, and they were blowing from another direction other than France. So we're going to get some pictures on this, and if anybody knows anything more about this anomalous event at the Seven Sisters, um, at the Seven Sisters um, Sea Cliffs by Cooden Beach, and how people were burned um, there with the gas... If anybody else knows anything about it, uh, please contact us. And we will be showing, I believe, on our website some of the photos that Mr. A took, which we owe him an enormous debt of gratitude as well for sharing with us. Absolutely. We hope to hear from all of you that have experiences like this. That would be great. Yes, it really would be. Mm -hmm. But I think this is a a really bizarre one because people were hurt, you know. I don't hope to get a lot of of instances of people being hurt. But if it happens, it happens. we got to know about it. It it does sound like a low-flying chemtrail almost or or something along chemtrail idea. Could be. Could be, Kate. I I, I I certainly don't uh, uh, say that wouldn't be the case. Coming up on Shattered Reality Podcast... Uh, we will. I have a few other listeners on, on deck who are interested in, in uh, expressing what they have experienced. And uh, also, I believe uh, all things working out well that we will have Dr. Irina Scott, um, who has written a very interesting <laughs> book involving uh, the UFO phenomena uh, at on our next uh, podcast. Uh, we also have uh, a Mr. David Bucher, who has written a, a, also a, a book investigating a particular uh, gentleman who had a lot of anomalous experiences, including purported UFO abduction. So um, for the next couple of weeks, at any rate, we will be in the UFO subject as it appears now. But as you know, dear listeners, things sometimes change. Yep. You never know because it's anomalous. And we are... Uh, Goodbye from from Shattered Shattered Reality. Reality.